All right, well, we have hit seven o'clock, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, we wanted to say good evening, everyone, and the Graduate Student Society wishes to welcome you to our virtual Faith and Scholarship Symposium. Thank you so much for coming. We're really grateful that Ryan Roberry and Joseph Bricky had agreed to address us on the topic of building their faith through their professional endeavors. We would love to begin our meeting with a prayer by Jessica Yanni, and she is a first year master's of technology student and also our GSS delegate for the College of Engineering. Jessica. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this opportunity to come together as graduate students in uh, these difficult times. We thank thee for the many opportunities we have to learn and grow together. And we thank thee for the blessing we have to be at a school where we can openly speak of um, how we can best blend our faith and our um, intellect that we might be able to be a blessing to many and um, help the Lord's work and help in, in our fields as well. We ask thy blessing on these speakers that they might have thy spirit, that um, the words that will help us will come to their minds and that we might all be able to um, learn and grow as we're in this experience together. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Thank you, Jessica. Um, so this evening, our program will begin with a brief introduction before hearing from Ryan Roberry. If you have any questions during his presentation, please leave them in the chat. We are gonna have a few minutes at the end of his lecture to ask him any questions that you might have. Um, after Ryan, we'll introduce and hear from Joseph Bricky and then follow that same you know, question and answer session at the end. So I'll start with our introduction of Ryan. So Ryan Roberry is Associate Professor of Law and he's the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and the Co-Director for the Center for the Comparative Study of Metropolitan Growth at Georgia State University College of Law. Ryan teaches property law, natural resources law, environmental law, and Anglo-American legal history. His research focuses on contemporary legal issues involving cultural and historic resources and on the medieval common law judiciary. Roberry's articles have appeared in numerous domestic and international law journals with some articles being translated into Spanish, Turkish, and Polish. He is also the co-author of two books, Historic Preservation Law in a Nutshell, a groundbreaking resource that provides the first in-depth summary of historic preservation law within its local, state, tribal, federal, and international context, and Land Use Planning and Development Law, one of the leading land use tre treatises in the United States. Roberry was selected as a Fulbright Scholar to Denmark, where he studied legal frameworks for protecting postal cultural heritage in the era of climate change. He was also tapped by the Organization of American States to assist 13 Caribbean nations with reforming their heritage or cultural heritage laws. Roberry graduated from Harvard Law School, where he was an Islamic Legal Studies Fellow, a Kravis International Fellow, and received the Irving Oberman Award in Legal History. Following graduation, he practiced environmental and natural resources law at Hogan Lovells in Washington, D.C. Before joining the College of Law, Roberry was a U.S. Supreme Court Fellow during which he collaborated with foreign judges and academics on judicial independence and rule of law matters. Prior to attending law school, Robey worked as a historian and an educator. He transcribed and collated all extant medieval manuscripts for the three Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. He also taught seventh grade at a charter school and lectured in English and history at Peking University in Beijing, China. He holds a BA in English from Brigham Young University and was selected as a Rhodes Scholar. At Oxford University, he earned a master's degree in comparative education policy and another master's degree in medieval British history. All right, Ryan, we'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, uh, Jordan. Uh, I should have just said read one sentence because you, you, you're you essentially taking up all my time. It's time to go home now. You know, I know I apologize for that. Um, I didn't know you're going to read it all. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> um, First of all, uh, let me just thank, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak tonight. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I'm, I'm living currently in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so I'm two hours ahead of you. It's about 9.05 uh, where I am. So the kids are in bed. My wife and I have about 15 minutes of exhaling before we fall over exhausted um, uh, during this time of pandemic. But um, 
what I, as I was thinking about what I would say tonight, first thing I would do, wanted to do is give a shout out to some of my law students who I see. I was at BYU Law a couple of years ago, about two, was it two and a half, two and a half years ago, taught there for a semester at BYU Law. And so I see Rusty, Christopher, Liam, a few others. It's wonderful to see you guys again. And just so excited as you guys embark on what you're going to do as you graduate uh, and head off into the legal field and, you know, as my older brother would say, just move money around instead of create any. Um, so, but uh, look, look, it's just wonderful to see you again. So um, Jordan, thank you again. Uh, I'm only here because I get harassed by Steven Christiansen. Uh, if you don't know Steven, Steven is my brother-in-law. So I'm married to his sister uh, and he kept harassing me and, and uh, I'm great because I think this is a really important topic. Um, so a little bit about me, just a little background that you may or may not know. Uh, Jordan read sort of the official CV and, and that's fine and dandy. Um, but as you all know, those are just words on a paper. Uh, so what I wanna talk with you a little bit about tonight is a little bit about my background and then really something that changed the way that I think and feel dramatically uh, with respect to my career and, and, and sort of where maybe at around the same stage where many of you are today. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk for 10, 15 minutes or so. And then what I'd like to do is leave, you know, 20, 15, 20 minutes of time, really for your questions, because I think that's, that's the most important thing here is to, if I can offer any sort of insight uh, that might help you, I'd love to do so. So uh, as you heard, I graduated from BYU uh, in 1999. Um, and was selected as a, a Rhodes Scholar, um, which is a wonderful construction related degree, building roads all over the world. Uh, no, I'm just teasing. Um, it is a, it's a scholarship where I was received free graduate tuition to go to Oxford University in England. Um, and it was a really big deal. Uh, I didn't guess I didn't understand how big of a deal it was at the time. Um, so I this just want to run run you through a few events uh i received the scholarship the next day was monday or monday morning so i came back to class and and uh was then whisked out of class and merrill j bateman was the president of byu then and had a meeting with him and a meeting with their um with the byu pr firm and they realized i hadn't shaved in three days so i looked kind of like this and then someone drove me home so that i could shave <laughs> And then I spent the next three days talking to reporters and it was a very surreal experience. And, and then, after, then three days after that, nobody cared about me anymore and no one wanted to talk to me because the story was old news. Um, but then when I went to Oxford, something interesting happened. Uh, I left BYU um, and pretty much left my, you know, all of my friends, we'd all grad, we're all graduating at the time, heading off into different careers, much like many of you. Um, and I got to Oxford and I was, I was incredibly sad. Um, and I didn't know why exactly for a while. Um, and that made me feel guilty. Uh, it made me feel like I wasn't appreciative of the gift that I'd been given to have this wonderful graduate experience um, and to meet people from all over the world. Um, and what ended up happening was I entered into a severe depression uh, in my life. And so it was very weird. I was away from family, away from friends, away from sort of everything that I knew. Um, they speak, a, they speak English, but that's a different kind of English, uh, over there. And, and I just spiraled, spiraled downward. Um, and it was a very, very difficult time for me. I decided to leave Oxford. I wasn't eating. I wasn't sleeping. Um, and what happened was I decided to go home. I said, what I want for me. And I left Oxford. I went home during the end of the, my first semester. And I was just like, Am I, can you guys hear me? Am I okay? Yeah, you're good. Okay. I, I just, my, it said my internet connection was unstable, but. Um, okay, nice dog. Uh, so anyway, I, I went home at the end of my first semester and just kind of a shell of a person. 
uh, and uh, and I had a crisis of faith, really. I was like, the experience that led me to apply for the scholarship and my experiences in the sort of scholarship meetings where I was speaking with people and where I was eventually selected for the scholarship, the spirit was so intense. It was made crystal clear to me that I wasn't going to Oxford because of any you know, intelligence that I possessed on my own, but it was because for some reason God wanted me to be there. That was made crystal clear to me when I was going there. And then I go there and I enter this deep spiral, this deep depression. And so I end up feeling guilty, like I failed God. I, this was an opportunity. Um, and I didn't really know what to do with myself. Um, and as I considered what I was going to do with my life and where my career was going to take me at that time, um, I eventually decided that I had to go back. Uh, to Oxford, that I knew that God, that that experience was meant that I should go back eventually. And so I returned the following semester. And luckily enough for me, my parents were in the position where I just told my mom and I said, Mom, this may sound really weird from a 24 year old, but I need you to come with me uh, to England. And so my mom came with me to England for two weeks to help me sort of reacclimate. Uh, to Oxford. And, and as I was working through that trauma in my own life, uh, and I didn't know it was depression at the time, um, as I was working through that trauma, um, it was an up and down, every single day was up and down. And what was constant was that I was praying and reading my scriptures. And the strange thing to me was, despite doing all of those things that I knew would bring the spirit into my life, I could not feel it. It was like there, like it was like I was cocooned in some sort of bubble wrap or something that the spirit couldn't penetrate. Um, and it was very, very disconcerting because I knew what it was like to feel revelation. I'd served a mission. I, I knew what I, I had the feeling in my interviews of what, what the spirit was like. And now for some reason, it was like I was shut out. Um, and I had, as I was working through this, this challenge, and I'll relate it back to eventually sort of career in just a moment, as I was working through this challenge, you know, I began to feel very, very guilty, very frustrated, um, very out of sorts, like I didn't have a direction, and sort of wondering why God had abandoned me. Um, and where all great revelations eventually happened, which was in the shower, um, I was taking a shower one day in Oxford, and I'd been praying and reading and writing my journal and being like, why, you know, why is this happening to me? I'm in, the, I'm in a place where I feel like I could help so many people and I can't even really get out of bed. Um, and as I was taking a shower one day, the spirit came in my mind and said, Abraham was Abraham, Moses was Moses, and Nephi was Nephi. And that's it. And what I instantly knew, and again, only through those moments when the spirit touches your life and your intelligence is sort of activated, what I instantly knew was that what that message meant to me was that I didn't need to look around anymore for a pattern on how I was supposed to live my life, but that Abraham, did, his path was trying to follow what God wanted him to do. Same with Moses, same with Nephi. They all had to leave what was one to them. And in some ways, I mirrored sort of what was happening to them. But more importantly, that that my path uh, was my own. Um, and I can't say that that personal revelation to me instantly cured me of anything. Um, what it gave me was courage and hope to continue, uh, to continue my studies in England, even though I was severely depressed. And I didn't find out that about this sort of clinical depression was never talked about in my family. I didn't realize until I started diving deeper into my family history that, that there's a, that I have some ancestors, it seems like there seems to be a pre genetic predisposition uh, to mental health issues. Uh, I didn't know any of that. And so I was sort of flying blind at the time. And once I really, it took about two years for me to figure out what was going on. And to some extent, I feel extremely fortunate about that because I know some people don't ever find relief. Um, but what, what it taught me was that although 
on the outside looking in, many people would say, oh, this, this guy's been given the Rhodes Scholarship. His life is perfect. He can do whatever he wants. Um, inside and inwardly, I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't, I couldn't actually approach, um, I couldn't approach grocery store clerks to buy my groceries because I was so emotionally hampered um, going on, you know, on in my mind and my soul. Um, and it taught me an extreme lesson, I guess a little bit maybe like what Moses learned uh, in the Pearl of Great Price when he learned that man is nothing, you know, but yet at the same time, he also had just been told that he was a son of God. And so it's that interesting duality between you are a son or a daughter of God. At the same time, we don't have much power when left to ourselves. Um, in fact, hardly any at all. And that was driven home to me um, in a very, very poignant way. Now, how does that relate to what I do now? Um, it taught me a few things. It taught me, one, it doesn't really matter. That big, long litany of awards and all that stuff that Jordan read at the beginning, uh, it doesn't really matter at all. Um, what matters is the kind of person that I'm trying to be. Uh, and that's something I, that is a takeaway. I think that you guys, as you're sort of embarking out into the world can, you know, you're going to have degrees. You're all in, you're all graduate students. You're going to have PhDs, law degrees, business degrees. You know, people are going to look and they're going to see that CV and it's going to say something to them. And, and I hope you probably already know this lesson. You're probably smarter than I am, but it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. What matters is how you treat people and the type of person that you are and that you are trying to act as the savior would act around everybody, even though you will be competing for jobs, even though you will ask, you will probably be put in positions of responsibility. Um, and some of you may have men, may struggle with mental health issues as I do. And I, in fact, I continue to struggle with them. It's not something that has gone away in the last 20 years. It's something that I've learned to live with uh, and something that I've learned to cope and during, I can tell you right now, during this time of pandemic and stress and trying to see my kids when they're dealing with stress and my wife, uh, it is really, really difficult some days for me to get out of bed. Um, and perhaps some of you are feeling the same. But I think what it taught me is that this thing that we call balance in life, balance between faith and scholarship or faith and career um, is individual and it's personal. Uh, reading your scriptures, saying your prayers, those are all wonderful things. I think those are, those are great things, but there, there are times that you may need something else um, and, that, and you have to be courageous enough to accept that. Um, my balance is essentially not your balance. Um, that again is another lesson that I've learned that, that I have to be humble and try to learn who I am myself instead of trying to look for, patterns are always good to have, but at some point, um, you will have to make peace with who you are uh, inside, with the strengths that you have, with and you know that Jesus will let us know who we really are. Um, so those are a few lessons I've learned. Now, what I, I took those and I just, I didn't know what I wanted to do um, at the end of Oxford. My wife and I moved to China because I had a Chinese friend who said, hey, come teach at Peking University. This was back before, you know, this was 2002, so nearly 20 years ago. Um, and from it was there that I learned that I really wanted to go to law school. I thought at that time that it was going to be doing something in international relations because I'd lived most of my life in my 20s. Um, but what I've learned um, and the way this experience has tied in is I am so grateful for this massive depressive episode um, because that has enabled me to connect to people on a level that I could never have connected throughout in China, in Turkey, and all the places that I now work around the world, Turkey, Australia, everywhere. It allows, it has allowed me to actually move past all of the CVs and cover letters and all of those kinds of things and to really actually just get to know people. And when they're hurting, I know what that feels like. And when they're joyful, I know what that feels like. And it's allowed me to connect with some unbelievably amazing sons and daughters of God who don't share our faith. 
um, in a way that I don't know if I could have done that uh, without this experience. And so now, as I've moved on to, into law, most of what I do now, now I teach, of course, um, but most of my teaching and research uh, deals with international issues around heritage and around history. And that's a very charged and can be very sort of political and, and dangerous thing. And, and the thing that I've noticed that cuts through all of those, all of the politics and the rhetoric and everything else like, like that is the shared human's experience of joy and suffering. And that's what I, that's what I wanted to convey to you tonight is the balance that you may be seeking between your faith and scholarship or faith and career, there is a necessary element of suffering um, that needs to take place and embrace that, learn from it. Um, I don't think I learned from it very quickly. I can be very stubborn and hard headed at times. Um, and it took me a while to learn and I'm still learning, but that is part balance. Uh, is the suffering, the mental challenges, the spiritual challenges when your faith is tested, when your relationships are tested, and that balance in life includes setbacks. It includes your path not going where you think it should go at this time, and that that is okay, and that you, you can weep about that if you want. You can weep about it, you can cry about it, you can laugh about it, um, and at the end, I think it's really about learning from it, as Joseph learned in Liberty Jail. Um, it's not about fairness, and it's not about equity. It's not about those things that the law allegedly stands for. Uh, it's about eternal knowledge. Um, and I think that was just the message that as I was praying and thinking of what I, what could I share with you most tonight that would be impactful from my experience, it is that it's okay to suffer. And it's okay to learn from it. And more importantly, it's okay to take that out into the world, into whatever career you're heading off into, and realize that that is what is going to connect you to your peers, to your clients, to other people, is this shared experience. And that's really where the power of relationships comes from, in my estimation, is this power of shared experience um, here on this earth. So with that, I am going to close. Um, my what I want to say, but what I'd really love to hear is questions from you. Um, it can be about mental health, it can be about challenges, it can be about the law, whatever you want. But what is how can I help you in the next 15 to 20 minutes? Is there some something I can offer you, some sort of comfort or solace that I can offer you as you guys are sort of coming to the end of your, your graduate degrees? Thank you. And everybody, yeah, feel free. Do I need to unmute them? I'll unmute. Um, raise your hand and I can unmute you so that you can ask the question. I don't know. Hi, um, I have been thinking a lot about this subject and, and was just wondering if you had any tips for disassociating, like, I feel like suffering like we often think like your butt when you're in pain you know something's wrong right. and something's bad and like mm -hmm. suffering is bad but like do you have any tips for kind of disassociating that and just kind of that have helped you lean into your suffering rather than kind of trying to run from yeah. it and numb it at the beginning i was trying to numb it and run for it because to me yeah suffering was i was doing something wrong right there needed some course correction needed to be made and I was beating myself up trying to figure out what that course correction would be. Um, and what I realized, at least for me, now I, I'll just share my experience and if it can help you, great, is that I was, I was realizing that I was not allowing the atonement of Jesus Christ to work in my own life. That's what it came to. I was not gentle with myself. I was incredibly gentle with others and would give them the benefit of the doubt and they could do whatever and I would not get mad at them. But it was something that I had to work on that I had to realize what that's also for me. Um, now, the way that I eventually learned and that was a pro it was a process, the disassociation for me, what I have to do, and this is something I still have to do is when I'm heading in that downward spiral, I have to actually physically move my location. For me, sports has always been a big part of my life or being physically active. 
and I actually have to go on a run, or play basketball. You know, now I can't play ball with my friends, but I actually have to physically change my surroundings to allow my mental, to allow what my eyes are seeing to change. Um, and that helps sort of, and it's not immediate for me, but it helps to trigger a difference. You know, if I were to just, at that point, if I were to get down and kneel or open up my scriptures, I'm still in my head and I can't get out of my head. And so what I do is I physically change my surroundings. I go out and for me, going outside really helps go on a walk, go on a run, or I find somebody that I can talk to, um, friend, parents, somebody to really just change the pattern that is happening in my mind. Um, so that's sort of the immediate piece of disassociation that, disassociation that I do. Uh, and then I, a lot of it is then just also learning to be comfortable with imperfection in myself. Um, and I'm still not comfortable with it, uh, to be fair. So uh, I, hope, I hope that can help. Ryan, I have a question. Um, it's a little bit different than um, what you've spoken on, but I'm from Georgia as well. I'm from Atlanta. Okay. Um, and I know that, so growing up, like with the faith that we have, you know, was a little bit harder in the South. Atlanta itself is different because it's different than the rest of Georgia. Um, but I was just wondering, like throughout your career um, and as you've like done more and more academia where sometimes like your faith can be challenged, Mm -hmm. um, you know, how have you dealt with that and, um, I know, grown stronger or maybe even like struggled? How has that been? Oh, sure. I mean, it, it goes both ways. I mean, during, <clears throat> during the depressive episode, I mean, I, I didn't go to church for several years, for not a year, for about a year. Uh, I didn't go to church um, because I was like trying to figure out what was right for me. And I didn't want the church and sort of all the social trappings that go with it. I wanted to figure out what was what was true for me. Um, as I've gone through academia, and as I've sort of recommitted when I read when I decided, hey, you know what, actually, this is what I believe. Um, and I think that's a multiple itera iterative process on what you believe. Um, sure, I mean, my faith has sure there are some people have I been laughed at? Absolutely. Um, but the more, and this is where I think meeting people on a human level and sort of your shared experience, the joys and the sorrows, more than, more than that, people actually talk to me a little bit more because of my faith, because there's sort of an expectation that, oh, you, you're not just living in your head. You also believe something beyond, right? Something beyond what I can see. And so really to me, it's been a blessing in many ways um, in the South, a lot of people here have a lot of faith, a lot of belief. Um, and so it's been very easy in the South to strike up those conversations, but even more so when I'm actually working in Muslim countries. Uh, in, in Turkey, I did some work with some Muslims in, in Singapore, um, people of great faith of different persuasions. Uh, that actually is what brought us together has been my faith. Uh, so to me, and, and this could be very different for other people, but to me, it has been a strength. There have been times when people have tried to ridicule that, um, times when I've had to stand up for myself, sure. Um, but also, but more often than not, actually, if you are living your life the way you think you should be living it, uh, people will respect it. So. Thank you. Kari. I just wanted to ask you about um, something that you just said, and that was that there was a time that you took a step back from the church. Sure. And um, I have a couple of friends that are also doing masters, and they have a similar situation where they're just needing to stay, take a step back. Sure. Um, what advice would you give to us as their peers as a way to kind of like help them through that time and not... Um, add more pressure or yeah kind of... this is challenging in our faith Kari I appreciate you bringing that up because you know suddenly you get on that list of the home and visiting teachers cruising around and always sort of circling around you um, you know what you can do I think the best one of the best things you can do is actually just tell them that you're proud of them Tell them that you're proud of them. I mean, we often think of 
people not going to church as somehow falling away or being less faithful or something. There's a stigma around it. But frankly, what it is, is growth. It's a growth period in many instances. And so I often, when I talk to people about it, I say, you know what? I am so glad that whatever you're struggling with, that you're struggling with it. And then I share, I would share some of my own struggles. You know, maybe it's a little different, but we all have our own questions and our own struggles. And you can say, you know what? I'm always here for you. Because sometimes people just want to be accepted for where they're at. Um, and we all, you know, over time we change, we grow, we're different. Um, so I, you know, would I pester them about, you know, sending them scriptures every day? Probably not, you know. But would I just take them out for a milkshake, which I love, take them out for a milkshake and say, hey, I just want you to know that I care about you. I'm not worried whether your butt is in the seat at church at all, but I care about you. And I just want you to know that I'm always here to talk and listen. And I would hope that, you know, if you open yourself up to them and your vulnerability, most likely they will reciprocate. And what you'll build is a stronger relationship, which is really, I think, what people are looking for. Okay, we have, uh, is it Nan Wei? Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, thank you for your talk. I really appreciate that. Um, so I'm a first year PhD student uh, from Taiwan. So if I don't mm -hmm. speak perfect English, I apologize. No um, um, so um, I, I feel like I can totally relate to your experience because in the past six months, uh, in my first year of PhD, I really feel like my energy were gone uh, mm -hmm. for most of the time. And I was kind of surprised because I was doing school most of my, in most of my life. Right. And uh, I was so shocked that for this PhD, it took me so much energy. So mm -hmm. um, there was some days I would, I, would, I would just, you know, I didn't want to wake up, you know, I yep. just want to lay in the bed and things like that. So my question is, because um, you're in academia right now, and I know the, you know, the academia can be a very long process, uh, uh, especially like for someone like me who wants to be a faculty member. Eventually, mm -hmm. it's going to be a like a marathon, and uh, I'm just kind of wondering, how do you keep your energy, your momentum during this long marathon? Yeah. Well, first of all, Nan, thank you very much. And I actually had the experience uh, to go to Taiwan and on the behest of the Taiwanese government uh, about a year ago and work with some people at different universities there. So I've been to your beautiful country. Um, it's abs the mountains are absolutely stunning. I think they're beautiful. Um, let, me let me ask, the I'll answer your question, but also roundabout way. Um, I also want to let you know um, that if you are feel like you're challenging, that you feel alone, that you feel scared, um, particularly as you're not in your home country and all these other strange weirdos in Utah are all roaming around, um, you can go to the counseling services and you can get help. Um, you can get find someone to talk to and maybe you've already done that, but I just don't want you to feel like you're alone. Um, secondly, you're the energy piece uh, for the PhD. Um, what I, what I found, I mean, what the, the, the big question I think for you maybe is what do you enjoy doing that not, is not your PhD? What do you like to do? And I, you have to find time uh, to unstring the bow. Like if a bow string gets too taut, it will eventually snap. We have to learn to de-stress and that's different for everybody. Um, and so what I find, again, what I find for me is I find that I have to exercise, physical exercise helps to take me out of whatever is going on in my brain and reset. Um, for you, it might be music. It might be something different. Um, it might be joining up with a group of friends, which is hard to do right now. Um, but whatever that is and whatever you have found, it could be you know talking with family back home, whatever you find um, that, that can help you sort of regain that energy, you have to do that on a consistent basis. Now, you're going to have, you know, down times and up times, times when you're more efficient and your energy is higher. And so some of it is just the normal rhythms of life. Um, at the same time, 
you have to, I think, find those, at least for me, those one or two key things that I have to integrate into my daily life, like exercise and like um, making sure that I spend time talking to my wife. I find that if I am not one with my wife, that I do not function well. Um, so I, I would think if you could find what those things are and then just make sure you're doing them, even if you don't want to for the first couple of days, because you probably won't feel like doing anything. Um, but, uh, know that you can get help immediately if you need it, number one. And number two, there are things that you can do in your life. And this requires you to sort of figure out what is it that you find relaxing, de-stressing, um, and then incorporate that daily, uh, into your regimen because self-care is incredibly important and it's not something that PhD students get a lot of. Uh, so I would encourage you to do that. And I hope that helps. Thank you so much. I appreciate your advice. Thanks, Tom. All right, Stephen. Yeah, it's actually Esther that has a question. So, yeah. Um, my question for you, this is something that I, I find myself struggling with. Kind of how you're saying you felt so strongly that God wanted you at Oxford and was mm -hmm. opening these door after door. I see that in my life with things that have been happening in my career, especially recently. And then I just get bogged down and busy and I get behind on stuff. And mm -hmm. I feel like I'm not optimizing those opportunities. And I feel like if I don't optimize them, the Lord won't trust me with more of them. Right. And it becomes this positive feedback loop of <laughs> then I become more depressed and I do less good work and then I'm achieving less and it's there. <laughs> yeah. So do you have any tips for... I don't know, kind of mental processes to break that cycle of self-sabotage. You, you explained it beautifully, self-sabotage, because I think most graduate students know exactly what that is, um, self-sabotage. Um, breaking the cycle of self-sabotage, I think, number one, I think part of it is actually learning how to be humble. Most people, most people in graduate school, you know, you've been told you're good, you've been told you're better than others, and you know, maybe we believe it to a little bit too much. Um, but to realize that while God has opened those doors, it's God's work, it's not your work. Um, and that essentially you are to be an instrument and you can say, look, I have about maybe 12 hours a day. I have 12 hours a day and then actually I have to sleep for a while, you know, 12 to 14 hours a day. And once I can say, God, help me to help me for these next 12 hours. Help me to know what to do, uh, because part of it is I think there's a growing process where you have to trust your own instincts. I think God leads us, at least he's led me a certain a certain way. And then he's basically saying kind of like to, to the brother of Jared with the stones, like, well, you're not going to you can't have windows and you can't have fire. So what are you going to do? Um, he expects us to do good things on our own and to trust that the experiences he's given us, he lets us try them out ourselves. Um, the mental processes, again, it, I, I mean, I always come back to me for exercise. It's, it's exercise. If I run a mile as fast as I can, I realize how weak I am and how incredibly, well, out of shape I am, number one, but also how incredibly weak my body is and really my limitations as a human being. And then I try to learn how to be gentle with myself. Um, and then pretty much if I am more concerned about making others feel good and trying to help them along with their life, I tend to find that things take care of themselves um, and that you can't do it all. And I think that's a lesson that some of us have to learn. We cannot do it all. And, the, and that, is, I think, is Satan's plan, right? Um, is that he ex you want to do it all and essentially you don't want to sin or you don't want to make mistakes or you don't want, you know, opportunities to pass you by. Um, but guess what? you know, they will, and you will, and we all will. Um, and part of that is learning then to rely more heavily on Jesus Christ rather than our own brain, our own, own intellect, or our own uh, perceived notions of what we should do. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Also, you're the best in-law. <laughs> Back at you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Does anybody else that maybe hasn't raised their hand would like to unmute and ask a question? Because I have a quick question if nobody else has one. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'll go sure. first. You were talking at the beginning, Ryan, and you were saying that essentially, oh, let, let me see if I word this well. Essentially, the muscle you were trying to flex or exercise was being comfortable with yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, like my, my perspective on a lot of these things that, it, you know, they're just kind of, out, as I framed it, these are things that you exercise. How did you exercise that one? Being comfortable with myself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of a weird question, but I feel like that's definitely a hard thing. And a lot of graduate students suffer with imposter syndrome and feeling sure. like they're not good enough. So how do you, how did you go about exercising that muscle? Um, I, I still feel that way. So imposter syndrome, I'm, I'm the associate dean. I'm supposed to be telling other people what to do and students, you know, what to do now. But I feel like an imposter still some of the day. And I think some of that the way we're wired a, a little bit. Um, the, one of the things that I try to do is I, I, tr I want first thing in the morning, I get up and I write in my journal. Um, and I just write sort of whatever comes to mind. Um, and when, what that helps me to do, and it's not long, two, three sentences, you know, what that helps me to do is actually, again, a lot of it for me is just getting outside of my head, stopping what I call the death spiral as you sort of go around and read feedback loop, call it whatever you want. Um, I, I write in my journal just how I'm feeling, good, bad, ugly, very honest, you know, very honest, what is, what's going on with me? And I find that that sort of primes the pump and lets me, it allows me to feel okay with feeling angry or frustrated or annoyed or happy or sad or whatever the emotions are. are it allows me, that gives me an outlet. Um, and I think some, one of the biggest problems with being comfortable with yourself is we don't have, we don't often give ourselves that emotional outlet. Again, we allow it for other people, but sometimes we don't allow it for ourselves and we have to realize how fragile we are too. And sometimes the only way to do that is to be overwhelmed and then you realize how fragile you are. Um, but really practicing self-care just early in the morning and very briefly um, has made a difference to me. Thanks. Awesome. Well, thank you, Ryan, so much. We, we really appreciate your presentation and we appreciate the time that you took to answer all of our questions. I really feel like you did an awesome job because we I feel like we asked you a variety of questions and you just really knocked them all out of the park. And I feel like you gave us a lot of wisdom tonight. So thank you so much. If everybody wants to unmute or anybody that can, to give them a round of applause, we'd love that. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Ted, appreciate it. Hello, Barry, we love you. I love you guys. Uh, you. Really, just just thank you for the opportunity. Um, honestly, th this is not something I planned on speaking about. I know you hear that all the time. I didn't plan on speaking about this, but no, I didn't. I mean, this was something that came to me late, and I was like, you know what? For whatever reason, this is kind of what needs to be talked about. And this is not; these are not experiences I typically share either. This is. But I, so I just, no one, I appreciate the opportunity because I feel like it helped me to reflect on some things I needed to reflect on as well. So thank you again for the opportunity and, and just best of luck. And again, if, there, if, if, if I can be of any help or use, um, you can just find me on the website, you know, Ryan Roberry, just type in Ryan Roberry, my name will pop up. You can always shoot me an email. We can have a chat. I'm happy to, to share or help in any way possible. And Thanks again to all my uh, former law students that I see here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so now we are excited. I'm excited to introduce Joseph Bricky. So um, Joseph F. Bricky graduated with a BFA, a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Brigham Young University in 2000. He spent over a decade studying independently from coast to coast, as well as in Europe and Scandinavia. After many years as an award-winning figurative painter, he decided to pursue a study of sculpture and moved his family to New York. He completed his MFA at the New York Academy of Art in 2012 and was awarded a residency to study stone carving in Carrara, Italy. This new direction in sculpture has now become essential to his artistic expression and purpose. He currently resides in Utah with his wife and seven children. Joseph paints in a style reminiscent of the old masters using classical form and composition to create an art filled with symbolism as he runs his own, I don't know those words. Joseph, what is atelier? 
the Beaux Arts uh, Academy in Provo to teach others how to achieve the same mastery. He believes that art should be both measure up in the museum and capture the common heart, that the greatest art that is which denotes the greatest good. Joseph. Okay, thank you, Jordan. Um, I assume you can, everyone can hear me okay, right? Um, good. Uh, so could I, I would like to share my screen. Um, Oh, and you've already given me that ability, right? So let me. I think Zoom has changed since I did that last. Oh, there it is. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to go through some images and um, talk some of most of them are my own artwork, um, talk about faith a little bit, but I want to say thank you, Ryan, for those amazing words. That was great. Um, that was very personal, um, uh, sort of a view of the underbelly of, of success and of ambition and aspiration and dreams that we all have. Um, and yet we're all, um, we're all children and uh, we're, we're all trying our best, but we have uh, a, a, a great um, treasure trove of shortcomings that God wants us to work with. So <clears throat> um, I appreciated those, um, that genuine and sincere uh, advice we got. Uh, I would like to talk a little bit, um, a little bit on the same vein, but a little bit first about faith and what faith is and the eye of faith. And as a lot of you are sort of on the kind of a, um, a threshold of into your career, your, your aspirations. Um, <clears throat> I, I hope you'll find some of this relevant. So this image you're seeing is of Lehi, a, a painting I did, Lehi finding the Liahona. Uh, I think thematically it fits with this idea of faith and scholarship and, and, and faith in looking forward to a long journey uh, of course, the Liahona symbolizes um, what the eye of faith can, can find. Uh, and I would like to talk about my artistic process in a way that um, illustrates this principle. So what you're seeing now is a sketch I initially did of this scene as I visualized, how should I do this painting? I sketched out a composition I thought of Lehi discovering the Liahona outside of his tent. Um, and you can see it's a very rough idea. And very often my paintings begin this way as sort of a, a rough image. Sometimes certain things are, are clear and other things aren't. Um, and I think this kind of epitomizes um, that, that stage of looking forward and perhaps having kind of an obscure path in front of you as you um, you know a direction you want to go, but you don't know every step. Um, <clears throat> this is a subsequent sketch. Here you see I'm focused on the setting, and Lehi is still unresolved, but I'm just trying to focus on an element of the scene outside of Lehi and, and what is this the setting. Um, And here you see, I, I kind of changed directions in terms of setting. And um, the image on the left is a, a, a rough sketch, having found the pose I want and, and, um, and I've sort of truncated the view of the landscape to get a closer view of Lehi and Soraya. So I'd like to kind of walk you through, through the painting process with the intention to illustrate to you what it's like to work through something when it you don't have the final version um, at hand and you're just trying to find your way. So this is Lehi's face uh, in progress. And there's a lot of stages in a painting where you hope no one walks in your studio because things are looking terrible. And it requires a lot of optimism, a, a certain quality of uh, what I would call hope to 
look ahead and um, and not be discouraged by how things actually are at the moment. So here is a little further along, a little further along, a little further. Things are beginning to take shape, but still not um, arriving where, where my hope is driving me. So that's the final stage. Um, I will say that, that this piece included, often my final stage is not the, um, is not, still does not measure up to what my initial hope was in the beginning. Um, but nevertheless, the entire process is dependent on an ability to, to look forward with, with faith and hoping for something um, and trusting that your efforts will pay off. So to go from the left image to the right is a journey. And one thing I love about being an artist, but this is not unique to art, it's just easy to illustrate, but it is, I think, universal to pretty much every endeavor we do, which is the journey to go from the actual, how things are now to how you hope things to become. Uh, is one that is kind of a thorny path, sometimes a windy path. There, what, what Ryan said so well about um, setbacks are, how, how did Ryan say it, that having balance includes having setbacks. And that is certainly um, a part of the artistic process. So the eye of faith is the ability to see beyond the natural sight. So our natural eyes see things in part, see the material world, see things um, not as they really truly are eternally, but as they are apparently in front of us. The eye of faith has to see beyond what the natural eye sees and see um, the eternal truth. So we move from seeing in part to seeing in full only through spiritual sight. So these young men, the, the stripling warriors we read about in the Book of Mormon, um, kind of this moment, I wanted to capture this moment before they go to battle because it kind of typifies this idea of the struggle of faith. I entitled this piece, They Did Not Doubt, because that's a phrase that re refers both to the mothers and to their sons. Uh, but it also perhaps typifies um, no matter how old we are, we are sort of at this stage of stepping out uh, into the unknown. So on the left, you see an image of the, this is actually the painted under, this is the underpainting. So this is like my first move onto the white canvas where I'm just painting in sepia tones and sketching in things and often, before I've done this, I've done a refined drawing and I've sort of figured out maybe what a certain face looks like. And as I start to begin the painting, pretty much all of that falls apart. And my face is uh, often, I, I start losing the look that I felt good about. And that is just part of the process. And uh, to finish a painting, you have to somehow refine um, what you lost. And I, I believe that the creative process intrinsically requires a certain brokenness to be healed. You, you have to have, um, the setbacks are just native to that journey. So again, the eye of faith has to see what is right in front of it and look beyond what can be, beyond to what can be, to see things in full. Alma says, do you exercise faith in the redemption of him who created you? Do you look forward with an eye of faith and view this mortal body raised in immortality and this corruption raised in incorruption to stand before God? 
I love the scripture. I love it because it talks about um, a kind of inspired imagination. I kind of live by imagination and um, he's asking us to look forward to this moment of standing before God. And so that is kind of the essence of faith. It's is to see something, you know, I've often imagined the disciples witnessing the crucifixion and what how devastating that would be. Um, but to see that and see the resurrected Christ through that is an exercise of faith. This is a sculpture I did. Uh, it's called Manifestation, but it is the moment that a blind man is, is um, Christ rubs uh, basically mud in his eyes and he asks him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And so he goes and as he washes the mud from his eyes, he begins to see. And I think there's a lot of beautiful metaphor in this uh, story. Number one, um, putting mud on the eyes would be the last thing you would think you want to do if you want to see better. And so there's, there's something about God's ways that are higher than our ways and certainly confusing to the rational mind sometimes. So that certainly, I think, fits the bill for a setback to put mud in the eyes of a blind man. Um, and, but the, the blind man goes and trusts Christ and, and goes and washes. And as the mud is washed away, um, he begins to see, but he begins to see first, he says, men walking as trees. His first moment of sight is not to have the whole world clear, but instead it's still fuzzy. It, it, it's a process of, of finding clarity. And I think that is a beautiful, um, a beautiful way of typifying the journey of faith is to see men walking as trees. Paul says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. For now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. So we have a lot of examples uh, in the scriptures of those who knew in part. Adam and Eve offered sacrifice. They didn't know why. They only knew in part. They didn't know in full. This is a drawing of Jeremiah, but sort of just typifies the Old Testament prophets who knew and prophesied. But even prophecy is knowing in part. This is a depiction of Lehi studying the brass plates. And uh, not only do we do things like Jeremiah, which is look forward, but we also do things like this image illustrates and we look back and that also requires faith to look back um, and see beyond what is right in front of us. I love the story of, of Nephi building the ship because um, number one, I often, uh, sometimes I, I like to joke that, um, that all the prophets ever talk about is art because I read through the scriptures and to me, it's just always about art. And, and so when Nephi builds a ship, I just think oh, he's, he's an artist and he's building something and he's a craftsman and, um, and he's shown a vision, uh, but again, in, in stages in part. And um, once the ship is complete, we see that Laman and Lemuel, one of the few times where Laman and Lemuel are humbled is when they stand before this finished ship. Uh, so an amazing example of, of faith. Of course, um, the, in church history, we see um, examples of faith and pressing forward through immense and unimaginable trials and, and challenges. Um, <clears throat> Michelangelo said this, in every block of marble, I see a statue. I have only to hew away the rough walls that imprison the lovely apparition to reveal it. 
this is an often quoted um, phrase for Michelangelo, sometimes in different versions, but the idea is that he's looking into the marble, this rough hewn marble and seeing the statue and he is just freeing it by carving it away, carving away the things that don't belong. This is one of my favorite images in art history. And of course it's the creation of Adam by Michelangelo. And a geometrical analysis shows that where the finger of Adam and God meet is at a very um, specific place in the composition. It's what's called the golden ratio. And Plato talks about this golden ratio as um, what he calls the dividing line. And in a platonic sense, that means this division between heaven and earth, the known and the unknown, what we see in the, with the natural eyes versus what we see um, with spiritual eyes. So, I want to show a few pictures of, of a project I did in Italy, uh, stone carving. And this was my first experience in stone carving. And I was, um, I was quite experienced at this point as an artist, as a painter, especially, but had never done this and was frankly kind of terrified of messing up, um, chipping away a piece of marble and it forever being ruined. So this is the beginning of carving out this marble block. And um, part of the process is you carve away a little bit and then you draw um, the forms you're looking for with the pencil and then you carve away those pencil lines. You lose your drawing, but you find the form just a little bit more. And uh, this is a very painstaking process. It takes a long time and you're redrawing over and over. So your those pencil lines for me kind of represent uh, in any life endeavor, sort of that the blueprint, the um, initial, um, the, the initial outline we might make in terms of setting goals or whatever. Um, it's not, uh, is not the actual completion of our dreams, but it just points us that direction. Uh, and then as you start the process, you necessarily carve away those pencil lines and you lose, you, you just, you necessarily have that kind of a creative setback, creative destruction where you are losing your work, but gaining something different. So here is a um, three photos together to show this process of drawing directly onto the marble, carving away that those pencil lines and getting closer to the forms you're looking for until you finally, after many repetitions, start to find um, hopefully that, that form that you originally envisioned. So here you see the finished marble next to one of uh, when it was in the beginning stages um, where it's still very rough hewn. And for me, this was an exhilarating experience, scary experience, but it was sort of a, the, a, an experience that epitomized the, the aspect of creativity that requires faith. And I think is, um, kind of an allegory for life in general, having to carve away um, with a, the eye of faith governing the entire time. Um, so when you're looking at the marble and it's rough like this, you literally look into the marble for that finished form. You're searching for it, you're carving it away and you have to hold that image in your mind the whole time. This is um, a photo of um, a mural I did for the Rome Visitor Center. And perhaps you've seen photographs of this where the Christus is and the 12 apostles. Um, in fact, Stephen and um, Esther both 
painted on this mural and that was really fun to have their contributions. Um, so here's a view of it outside of the visitor center where you can see it from the outside. And uh, when I first began this project, I realized it was the setting dictated so much about what this painting should be about. And for me, when you're looking at the room from the outside, it's as if you're looking through the veil. And I wanted that idea of the veil to be a dominant theme in how I made decisions about the mural. What you're seeing now is an image of the, uh, what, what an artist would call the cartoon or the initial drawing uh, of the composition. And uh, because it's on a curved wall, I had to create curves that were basically counter curves so that when you saw it in perspective in place, um, those curves would look straight. So when it's flat like this, the sun rays and the horizon are all curved. And that is because you can see in this, um, this uh, site plan view of, uh, of the room, the mural is wrapped on a curved wall behind Christus. And what that does is create a back plane and a front plane. And artists, painters often talk about how the painting is a window into a, a world, or in other words, it's a, a kind of a type of veil. But in this case, there was sort of two veils. There's the back plane and the front plane. It didn't have an actual physical plane because it was on a curve. So this image is of the mural as you would see it in perspective standing in front of the Christus. And here is a view of the Christus. So you see that the the mural is designed to, um, to be seen with the Christus. The sun is coming behind him and echoes his gesture. So in this view, you see that the horizon line, which I've highlighted in green, looks straight. But this is what it actually was when it was flat. And the light rays coming from the sun the one I've highlighted in yellow uh, actually looks horizontal when you are in the room coming straight out from the sun. So um, one of the things I realized as I was planning this piece was that um, the perception was a big deal how you perceive things was very different than how things actually were. Um, and it also so happened, and this was just built into the, the nature of the space, the Christus that stood in the middle of the room was at the golden ratio, what again, what Plato called the dividing line between the front plane and the back plane of the mural. And the magic of the golden ratio is that it is perpetual in, in its iterations and so, um, I made the dominant viewing the, the place where you would see um, the Christus in front of the mural and where everything would come together and all the lines would be straight was at this viewing plane, which was in golden ratio to the Christus and the back plane. And so the experience I was trying to create was that as you stood in front of the Christus, there was kind of a veil kind of experience um, where it was as if he was standing at the veil. And um, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, this is something that we all wrestle with. I, I think we probably put a lot of maybe too much um, virtue in this idea of what we know. And, um, you know, sometimes you feel obligated in testimony to say, I know blank, and, you know, such and such. Um, and it's, it's a great thing to have come to know something. But knowledge is really, that which belongs to knowledge is really on our side of the veil, on this side of the veil. 
And that which belongs to belief is on the other side of the veil. And I have found in the creative process that there is great power in working through belief, not just knowledge. Um, and um, being, like Ryan said, um, being comfortable, learning to be humble, being comfortable with um, what your, your limits are and, um, and being honest about it so that you can really look beyond those things. Um, and, um, you know, whatever your career is, you will struggle with faith. You will struggle with discouragement. You'll struggle with challenges that seem beyond your capacity to meet. Um, and I think probably any career that is really going to create growth, inner growth, it will be a career that challenges you uh, mentally and emotionally. And, um, and you will find um, yourself at the extremity often. And so um, I am so grateful for knowledge we have of faith and it really is powerful. It really does open the veil, uh, but it certainly um, comes at a high price. And part of that price is to, um, to experience setback and not lose faith and not lose hope. So I hope all of you have a transformative uh, journey that is both part because of a career you choose and a path you choose, but most importantly, um, beyond scholarship is um, a, a journey that is very personal. And um, like Ryan said so well, the equation of balance, uh, you know, the ancients talked about balance, the Greeks, balance was everything for in Greek philosophy. Um, and the golden ratio again represents that point of balance. So in other words, balance is found from, in, in one sense, what you're able to do and what you're maybe is just slightly out of reach and finding where are those limitations? Where is the veil for you um, in whatever endeavor you're in and living, living on that threshold, uh, pushing yourself. And it does, um, it, it does mean you'll fall sometimes, uh, but that's, that's the beauty of the atonement and the beauty of, of Christ as our shepherd. Um, so anyways, that's, that's basically what I intended to say so we can open up to questions or, or whatever. Yes, awesome. Please, um, if anybody, if you want to raise your hand and I can call on you or if you have a question, um, please unmute yourself. Um, Joseph, I had a question. Um, I noticed in your bio that it said that you have um, seven children and you were just talking there at the end about finding balance. And I was wondering, you know, how you do that in your life with such a large family and such a successful and amazing career. Well, you know, um, maybe I'll refer to the Greek idea of balance to answer that question. Dynamic balance often means that um, it's not static. It doesn't, it's, it's not the kind of balance that, um, that remains if you don't move. So in a composition in art, often instead of placing the main, you know, the, the, the main focus right in the center of the painting, um, ironically, I have the picture of the mural where Christ is dead center, but typically you don't set things dead center because um, if you set something just off center and then you counterbalance with something on the other side of the composition, you, you create a kind of dynamism and it's lively and it's risky, but it's compelling and dramatic. And one of the terms for this is contraposto, which is when it's re referencing say the, the, the body's position, one side is active and one side is passive. And, and it's just not, it's not just left and right, but it's, 
the right leg is active, the left leg is passive, but then the right leg or the right arm is now passive and the left arm is active. And so that creates a kind of dynamism, which is um, not static and not safe, but certainly human. And I think in life is just this way. Like, I don't know if there's ever, I've never felt my life is in balance, but I have felt like um, I duly compensated for when it was imbalanced. And, um, you know, I think Stephen R. Covey many years ago, uh, I remember hearing from him this idea of seasons of imbalance. So, you know, spring is full of flowers and, and summer is full of something else and fall and winter have their focus. None of them are in balance, but overall there's a cycle that, that balances out. And for me in life, it's about cycles. It's not about moments, it's about cycles. Thank you. Um, Nan, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, thank you, Joseph, for showing us uh, so, so, uh, your wonderful artwork. And I really appreciate that. So um, as I look at uh, your artwork, a uh, question just came to my mind. Uh, it's probably not directly related to face, but uh, it's been a question that I've been thinking a lot lately. So. I'm kind of curious when you are working on your artwork, how do you convince yourself this is good enough? So like, my question is what good is good? So um, as I think through uh, my life, uh, especially in the past 10 years, uh, it's been a very digital time. You know, We have so many distractions and so many responsibilities and things to take care of, but we only have so, much limited amount of time and the energy and such. So I'm kind of curious when you're working on your work, like how do you tell yourself, hey, this is good enough. I need to work on to the next next work, you know? Because I imagine you can keep improving your work um, and uh, you, I don't know, maybe you probably won't see a, a, a point called perfection Maybe it's a, you know, it's kind of like a, um, you know, um, uh, endless, you know, process to improve the work. Um, so, so my question is, how do you know um, if this is good enough? Yeah, that uh, that's a very good question, and it kind of strikes at the heart of things that, for me, or you know. Um, can be very discouraging. You know, there's the book on Michelangelo that's a sort of a dramatic um, history of his life. It's called The Agony and the Ecstasy. Um, and that I think epitomizes um, what it's like to, to be a perfectionist, but then um, to, to fall short, but also enjoy what you're doing. So I, I will honestly tell you that I, almost without exception, have felt almost basically like a failure at the end of a painting. Um, but I have learned to um, judge things a little bit differently, at least I try to. Um, you know, Elder Eyring many years ago when I was very young, well, not very young, but I was like early 20s. And uh, I went to a fireside by President Eyring and he said, he will always, he, he always feels um, like a failure if he judges his talks by how, how much better he could have done. Instead, he's learned to judge them by whether or not they had the effect they were meant to have, they were meant to, to have. And, um, and I think that's a, a, a broad reaching principle. Um, Having just talked about that, that row mural, I will say that I did that mural um, under a lot of duress with, with not enough time and other things happening. And I felt failure coming the whole time. I was just so, I, I dreaded, you know, the, the possibility of failing. And, um, and 
because I always have that feeling at the end of a project, um, I feel like it wasn't quite what it should have been. Uh, but when, when I was there in that space and they took the scaffolding down, it was the first time I actually saw it completely unobscured in the space where I could actually stand in front of the Christus and like um, see if it had the effect I thought it should when I first conceived it. And I was shocked that I, that I felt like it hit the target, that it wasn't a failure. And I, and I was su quite surprised actually. And I think it was because um, my judgment wasn't, was, was it a perfect painting? Was there anything I would still wanna change? But instead, did it feel right? Would it feel right to those who experience it? And, um, and I felt the feeling that I hoped it would, it would convey. So I think um, that's a difficult question to answer fully, but I think part of the answer is to look at your life and look at your goals and look at the thing you're trying to succeed in and make sure your measuring stick is the Lord's. And I think, um, you know, it's not that the Lord is less demanding than your peers and then, you know, than your professors or other things. And, and, and so you want to measure up by other measuring sticks. But in the end, um, the Lord uh, does measure differently. And, um, and sometimes if you look to purpose, you find the right equation of whether or not you've done, you've done your best is if, if it fits, if, if you've measured up to your purpose. Thank you very much. Okay, Joseph, we have a question from the chat um, and it says, how much do you think your art is influenced by your craft and your hands-on experience and how much is inspired by your faith? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's really, it's kind of blurred, I think, because frankly, if you've been doing art for 20 years and your craft isn't somewhat tied to an exercise of faith, you haven't been very faithful. You haven't like exercised your faith in the long, in the long run. So, um, you know, a painting is in part a product of your performance in the moment of painting. And then it is perhaps even more so a product of your performance over many, many years of study and preparation and so forth. So I think religious artists especially have a, an obligation to, um, to devote their lives to a kind of excellence that, is, um, that their subject deserves. Uh, so in part, you know, craft, those material technical um, methods and so forth are essential to an artist, to a, a law student, to whatever you're doing. Um, and, but your faith is the thing that governs your, your struggles and your efforts and exertions um, week in and week out and, and year to year. And so ultimately it really comes back to faith. Whatever, whatever your skill level is, is it's, it's ultimately a function of your faith. Um, and so that, that might be dodging the question a little bit in terms of you know, sometimes a specific project you, you can you can not engage your faith and just engage your skill and your and your craft and um, and certainly craft is a big part of that equation of of creating a painting or creating a piece of artwork. Um, but if you're pray, prayerful and humble and really seek to operate by faith, you do find different solutions. Good question. Thank you. All right, Stephen, you've got one. Yet again, it's Esther. Yeah, lurking here. Mm -hmm. um, so as someone who was involved with that project to some extent and kind of got to see the, the dirty underbelly of it, I know it was definitely not a path of sunshine and roses. And a, a question, it's maybe not necessarily something for me personally, but I think something that might be good for this group to hear. How do you separate negative experiences with business people, within the church and you know whether that's like actually working with the church or like people you know who are members of the church and your faith because i've known many people who you know had business dealings with their bishop and they went south and they're like well because my bishop bishop is a shady business businessman then i've lost my testimony in the church and yeah i don't know what is your take on how to 
balance that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what comes to mind is actually some, something that came to my mind during that project, um, being frustrated with people who, that I was working with. And, um, and a metaphor came to mind, which was the Lord, and I'm so grateful for this, the Lord allows us sometimes opportunities to play in his sandbox, as it were. He lets us into his backyard and we get to come in and he lets us into his work and we get to participate. And essentially every missionary gets to play in the Lord's sandbox. And every member of the church gets to play in his sandbox. And while you're playing in the sandbox, you know, the other kids come in and, and they start sometimes ruining your experience. And um, you start resenting the other kids that are in the sandbox. And I realized that it wasn't my place who got to play in the sandbox. I should just be grateful to be able to play and, and whoever is in the sandbox is because it's, his, it's by his invitation. And he knows things that we don't know about their life, about their struggles, about their, their history, about their intentions, you know, about decisions they maybe have made or maybe haven't yet made. Um, but uh, uh, he gets to choose who, who we get to do this work with not us. And um, so certainly, you know, like forgiveness is, is going to have to be everybody's talent at, by the end of life, because we're all going to get burned. And it's just part of his plan for some reason. Um, but uh, I, you would think that in his church and in, in his kingdom, that um, you would get burned less, but you can have just you know, broken hearts and broken dreams because of really broken, you know, promises or whatever else. Uh, but again, um, setbacks are part of the plan and wounds are even part of the plan. And uh, Christ is the ultimate example of that. Awesome, thank you. I actually have another question that popped up while you were talking, um, totally different direction, but how do you balance uh, things in your career that contextually would go against the gospel. And I know you and I have had this conversation before, but, you know, as artists, we go do nude figure drawing sessions. And in any other career to go sit for six hours and stare at someone's live naked body would be considered inappropriate, right? But I've had very spiritual experiences in that setting. And you know, I, I know you have as well. So how do you communicate that to others? And how do you find peace with that when it's something that is contextually appropriate? Yeah, I mean, context is is always an important part of an equation. Um, I will say that um, you have to find, you have to strike a balance that, um, again, what Ryan Roberry said, you know, balance is always, your balance may not be my balance. Um, and um, it's, to, to strike a perfect balance means, you know, you're, you're doing a lot of individual judgment, not just like applying, um, uh, applying some operation manual to your life. Uh, but I do think that there are some principles always engaged in that. Number one, um, if you're only mimicking what the world does and what the world justifies it, you probably haven't found that right point of balance. Um, and that would be, you know, at, in your example of studying the figure, in what way are you studying the human body? Um, the human body is a temple and it's okay to study temples, um, but do we study them in an appropriate way? and Do we reverence them and so forth? You know, so there's, there are um, ways to approach whatever our study is, uh, but most likely, that way will grow and be refined as we are refined. And we shouldn't expect that the way we approached life, um, you know, in our younger years will be the same way that we do in our older years. Um, and, and hopefully our faith is growing, not shrinking during those years. And we learn to strike a better balance. But um, there will always, in every career, there are those things that are kind of paradoxical, perhaps, you know, have, create some tension with our, you know, our conscience or, or even our covenants. And we have to 
make sure we're loyal to, to the Lord and we find what his way is in, in our path. Um, but, um, you know, um, I, I don't know. Uh, it seems like there, there are certainly principles of wisdom in certain paths and you can sort of um, rely on, on those conventional ideas, but so much life throws at you these curves where you just have to judge by the spirit. And I think more and more we're entering a day without precedent. I mean, we've been living through a year without any precedent. And I think that seems to typify the latter days is to not have precedent, to not have a conventional um, structure by which we judge things. So uh, I do think President Nelson's emphasis on personal revelation is, re is related to the times we're in. Well, thank you so much, Joseph. We have come to the end of our symposium. So we want to thank you for your presentation to the graduate students. And um, if everybody could you know, throw in some clap hands on the screen or anything, thank you so much. And we want to thank everyone for attending our Faith and Scholarship Symposium. Um, this has been recorded and will be available to watch on our YouTube channel um, shortly um, on the BYU. So if you go to BYU Graduate Student Society um, on YouTube, you can find it there to rewatch if you'd like. Um, also, a reminder that uh, to stay up current with like our events and things like that, you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at BYU Graduate Student Society. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Joseph, and have a good night.